Hi, my name's Jason Soares, and welcome to The Best Bulls. This is The Milkman, and today we're going to go over a day in the life in Jason Soares and The Best Bulls Ranch. On top of that, we're going to go over dog DNA, the basics of dog DNA, going over all the different colors and the rare colors, the exotic colors, all that stuff. And then, of course, we're going to go over the facility build out, show you the construction, and all that stuff as well. Hi, my name is Jason Soares, and welcome to the Best Bulls Ranch. So, a day in life in my shoes, in the best at the Best Bulls Ranch, is crazy because I have I have a lot of things, and I'm not complaining. I love it all. So I have to manage, you know, <laughs> the Best Bulls, and I have to. Uh, uh, a little disclaimer: I have to get better at, at managing. I probably need to get some more people to help me out. But um, it's hard to get people that are going to do it to your level, the, what you expect with your attention to detail. And I'm a very OCD attention detailed person. But, I mean, just a little quick paraphrase or summary of what I do. I have my family life. I have my daughter. I have um, to deal with, you know, puppies. And puppies are crazy high stress. Like, especially when you care about them so much. Puppies are insane high stress because they might get a little cough and now you're worried about getting sick and now you're trying to treat them or they are sick or they're not sick or they have any kind of little problems. Um, and then one little wrong thing with a puppy could be death, you know? Then you have, I have my, my dogs, which is the same thing. You know, I'm always worried about sickness or anything like that. Um, any kind of problem when you have as, the dogs like I have or as many as I do, you always have to deal with something, stopping problems from happening. I have to deal with the build out facility uh, you're gonna see a little drama with that, how I deal with that every single day, mistakes happening, um, and with that cost money and time, and, and sometimes are irreversible. So you have to deal with that, and puppy deliveries, people uh, dealing with studs, uh, people wanting to do stud service, shipping out semen, meeting people to, to do dogs, dog, deliver, dog stuff, I'll show you some more of that. So we have all that. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a lot, <laughs> but let's get into it and, and show you some of that right now. So on an everyday basis, I wake up in the morning and first thing I do is I, 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 um, I usually check the puppies, make sure everyone's good there. I'll check the dogs, even if I'm not going to feed them yet, I'll check everyone to make sure, you know, there's no one's stuck, no one's this or that. You know, when you... When you've been doing it this as long as I have, you'll see crazy stuff happen, you know? A dog will get stuck in an area that you didn't think they could even get stuck or something will happen. So I always just check them. And then not even talking about myself or my daughter or my fiance dealing with that, that stuff, then I go into feeding them. And feeding them is a process, especially the morning process. That's when I go into, I give them all their vitamins. I, um, I mix wet food in with the food, I do all that stuff. So morning is a longer process with feeding them. And then I have to let them out after feeding them. Now, laying them out, uh, I, I always, I'm outside watching because we, we have a 150 by 70, 150 feet by 70 playpen coming. It's still not here, it's, it's, getting, it's coming in. And that's where they're gonna go and to be, to be, you know, go out to play. They have pools there, they have jungle gyms, all kinds of stuff like that. But right now we don't have that. So I stay outside and I monitor them outside and they stay out for anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour every time. And it's good too because at the same time I get to interact with the dogs, I get to watch the dogs, I get to put my hands on the dogs. Like I always tell everyone, attention is the most important thing with dogs. If you ignore your dogs, um, if they have a problem, it doesn't get caught until it's super obvious. You know, like if a dog has a has a rash, a little rash behind the ear, if you're always paying attention to them, like in holding them and touching them and watching them, you're gonna notice it right away, you're gonna treat it, it'll be gone. But if you don't always pay attention to them, by the time you notice it, it's huge. And now it's a huge problem because it's, it's attacked their immune systems and all kinds of things. Like, like Milkman, he has no problems. I'm, I always have hands on him, everything, all day. I'm rubbing my, my nose a lot because funny, funny, funny thing about me, I'm allergic to, allergic to dogs pretty much. And, um, but I don't care, I like him. So, so I'll deal with the, the allergies. But yeah, so in, um, so in the morning, or I, I feed them all, I let them out, I watch them, I look at them, I see everything. And this is just the basic stuff, like it's not including, you know, all the other stuff that I have. And then we get into, you know, construction to have the construction people either already here when I wake up or they're coming. And then 
like for Aaron, we have a we have like a, every week we have a, you know a, a list of what we want to get done, uh, and my job is to manage that and make sure everything gets done properly and how I want it because I'm very like I said I'm very detail oriented OCD. On top of that, I'm also dealing with you know people wanting pictures of the puppies that they have reserved or handling the social media accounts, which is a big thing. Like take, you don't understand how much time it takes to video and take pictures of the dogs and then post them and and then and then upload stuff. That's a that's hours and hours a day uh, staying on top of this YouTube and everything like that. So make sure you click down below, subscribe, leave me comments, leave me likes. I put so much work into this for you and I hope you enjoy it. So let me know what you think. But we do that. And then we have to let the dogs out again. Then we have to feed the dogs at night. And there's a, there's a lot that goes to it. And then I'm usually working with some in some capacity with the construction, getting work done, helping Aaron, dealing with <laughs> dealing with with getting new properties. Uh, we just got. I'll announce it now. We just got the um, the two properties that surround us. So one across the street and the one next to us. So that's going to allow us more space for the dogs, more space to expand the Best Bulls Ranch. Check this out right here. It's a nursery and we have all the plants too. We bought all the plants. And so this is gonna help um, help help uh, us, what's it called, landscape. Landscape the Best Bulls Ranch, the, do the facility. And then on top of that, we have more space now to do more of the things, to be more homestead style and, and do that. So. Definitely going to be posting more about the homesteading and, and all that stuff and showing that. We're going to probably try to grow microgreens and have garden and, and do all that stuff. So it'll be fun experience. At the same time, focus on bulls. Milkman wants to get down and run around. Love him. So yeah, on top of doing all the uh, the dog stuff, on, we're doing this expansion. And then we're probably going to get into bulls, horses, cows, all that stuff. So that will be fun. And we're definitely going to show all that as, as we progress. And you are going to see us from the, you know, the start to the, um, to the finish. Milkman, what are you doing? You peeing? Yeah, he was peeing. <laughs> but yeah, Milkman's so funny. Look, look, how, look how agile he is for a little puppy, right? And this is why. So the purpose, if I wanted a dog to watch over the properties, I would not get a, a bulldog. Like, he's not going to watch over my property. He can watch over my house and be inside my house and bark at people if they come in or whatever. German Shepherd is going to watch over my properties, you know? But yeah, so this is the, the new, new, new The Best Bulls Ranch 2.0. We're going to be adding stuff to it. It's lots of cool plants and everything like that. Um, there's all kinds of stuff. Baba, come. Milkman, let's go. Let's, sh let's show them some more stuff. Check this out. Look, we had the guides working yesterday. And we have all these hedge plants now that will be going. We had those cleaned out. Actually, Wick, stay close. And we have bigger ones down there. And we're gonna be putting those, lining the driveways with them and doing everything. It's gonna be really nice making the making the Best Bulls Ranch super nice property. That's gonna be fun. But it's also high stress too. And, and a lot of people don't understand owning any business, how stressful it is. And, and um, it's probably really stressful owning uh, I never owned a restaurant um, or any other business, even the online business. I've owned an online business. It's, it's stressful, but I can tell you right now, and fighting, fighting, I, I fought professionally. It's stressful, but I can tell you, even with fighting, that owning dogs, owning live animals is the most stressful thing in the world. I love my dogs, so it's good, and, and I think it's so stressful for me because I love them so much, and I care about them, not getting sick, not getting hurt. I'm always worried about them. That's why. I rarely leave, and if I do leave, someone's here watching over the facility, watching the cameras, watching the dogs, because I don't want anything bad to happen to them, because they're my responsibility. I, they can't do a lot of things for themselves, so I, I took that responsibility by having them, so it's my responsibility to watch them. But that being said, like a female having puppies, and then you worry about the puppies, and having to make sure they get fed every three hours, it, this is the highest stress, one of the highest stress jobs in the world. I know they say like air traffic controllers is, is a very stressful job, I think this is more stressful, because they can't talk to you too. Like Milkman, last night was making like a little noise. Turned out it was nothing, but I'm like, is he getting sick? Like, do I need to treat him or not? Like, and I pay such close attention to my dogs purposely for that reason. So I can sort of stop bad things from happening before they happen. And that's what you have to do. And I'm a very, I'm an optimistic person, but I'm also, I'm pessimistic too, because I'd rather think bad 
and stop the bad thing from happening than wait for the bad thing to happen, you know? And uh, that's what I do. <laughs> so, and I think that's why, I, you know, I'm successful in the dog business. I'm why I'm successful with the puppies, with the studs and everything is because I don't leave anything to chance. I leave nothing to chance. If there's a 0.01% chance of my dog getting injured, I take that. I And it's gonna cost me a lot of money to make sure that doesn't happen. I spend the money. Like, I, I don't care. Uh, because it makes me so I can sleep better at night and that's just how I have to, that's how I've always been. So I deal with the guys working. Then it gets even better than that. Then I'll have someone hit me up at nine o'clock the other night, like last night, and I have to go do a, um, a, stud, uh, a breeding with Fury. All right, it is like 1 a.m. We are here with Eric. Eric, what's the kennel name? Doggy's Gone Wild. Doggy's Gone Wild. All right, you can never say that my service is bad, right, Eric? Yeah, Listen, not Eric, at all, man. It's Eric hit me up. Watch. Eric hit me up tonight. Needed Fury for a rebreed. All right. Yeah. Not like, not like, like, uh, like he's get, like it's a rebreed. A lot of people like, a lot, a lot, a lot of breeders get um weird rebreeds and they won't put as much effort into it because obviously they're not getting paid then. But it's a rebreed. He called me. We show up here 1 a.m. Fury's doing his thing, and we're hoping for a successful breed. And she levels are super high, so. Nice tonight. Had to be done. So breeding is done. <coughs> Sorry, can't see that well. Breeding is done. Uh, Doggy's gone wild. Hit me up to rebreed. And uh, you notice I said something there. I'm like, even though it's a rebreed, is the way it works with um, at least with us and, and most you know legitimate um, stud owners is they're gonna give you a, a free rebreed, uh, if not an unlimited free rebreeds until you get a litter of two or more with that female. Um, depending on which, you know, who you're talking about. We, we do unlimited cur currently right now. And a lot of times, you know, when you first do the the, um, the initial, you know, stud credit, when someone pays for a stud credit, you do the initial insemination and you're getting paid, you know, between, you know, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight thousand dollars to do the, um, to do the breeding. And of course, there's benefit there, so of course you jump through hoops and do it. But a lot of times, now for the rebreed, let's say their female didn't take for you know God knows what reason, they um, the rebreed they're gonna hit you up. And a lot of a lot of stud owners or a lot of people and you know get a lot of bad rep because when it's time for the rebreed, they really won't jump through any hoops and make any serious kind of moves to make it happen because obviously they're not getting paid to rebreed and sort of annoying. But, you can't say that, I, I truly take a huge amount of pride in giving amazing service to everyone, whether it's they're getting a puppy from me, whether they're asking just regular questions, whether um, they got a stud credit for me and I can help them anyway. And this is a rebreed, they hit me up, Doggies on Wild, Eric hit me up at 9 something p.m. on uh, Monday night. And uh, I have puppies, I have a sick child, um, a sick teething child, so you know, she, all that stuff. So I have all kinds of excuses, but anyway, um, hit me up and said, he needs the breeding done. Can we get it done tonight? Levels are high, it has to be, like, it really has to be tonight. And I said, let's happen, let's make it happen. So I drove out, 1 a.m. right there. I don't know if you can see it on the block. 1 a.m., got the breeding done. I'm trying to give the best service I can possibly give. And, he, and what, what sucks too is that, you know, in the last six months, I've probably had about two people get mad at me for, for ridiculous reasons, but you can't please everyone. And, um, and I, and I really try, but at the end of the day, I'm sure if you're a business person or you know, you've been involved with, you know, a lot of, a lot of customer service, there's no, there's no pleasing everyone, but I try to please everyone. And, um, my goal to, but obviously I'm not going to, but on things like this, I, it's really, it makes me happier too when there's people like Eric, the dog, that, the owner of the, um, the female, I always appreciate of me, you know, jumping through hoops and doing this for him with late notice and stuff like that, because I would want the same thing done to me, so I try to treat people how I'd want to be treated, or even better, you know, and the people that have gotten mad at me recently have been ridiculous reasons, like I can tell you one, it was a stud as well, the guy got mad because we did a breeding, you know, then take for whatever reason, we know that, and then he wanted his money back, and I'm like, no, it doesn't work there, I, I did jump through a lot of hoops, I did my service, I didn't do anything wrong, we can do a rebreed, that's fine, but it's not how, how it works, and no stud owner does that, I, I'm not, I'm not going against any kind of, you know, uh, uh, 
that standard. And then, you know, I go above and beyond, honestly, where I do three rebreeds and totally your female takes. Not just one. A lot of people just do just one. Regardless, Monday night, I think it's Monday. <laughs> and now it's good. Now it's Tuesday early morning. Go home. We are filming a new episode of The Best Bulls in the morning, so I gotta be up early for that. Get the dogs done. Just another day in the life of The Best Bulls. And that's all. I appreciate you for uh, the support. If you have any questions about anything, especially the dog breeding, about Fury, look at Fury right now. Fury is passed out. <laughs> He's tired. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments, in the email, my text message. I'm always, I'm, I'm putting now my, uh, my my phone number on all my things is wiremark because I have so many scammers trying to pretend to be me. So now everyone's calling me, but if you have questions, just hit me up. I take pride in giving the best service possible and, and doing everything the best, hence the name, the best bulls. So that happens, you know? So this is a 24 seven lifestyle that I chose. And like I said, it's my responsibility to take care of dogs, but I chose them, they didn't, uh, they're too, they're not, they can't do what I can do, for, so I have to watch them. So it's a 24 seven lifestyle. And if you don't love the dogs, I don't recommend you doing this. I know a lot of people, I know you watch me sometimes, a lot of people watch me just for you know information, you have a pet, great. And some people wanna do what I do. And I don't recommend it because it is very hard. It's 24 seven, it's uh, very costly, lots of things. But I, I do believe in doing what you love to do. And I love doing this, so it's what I chose to do. But one thing that, 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 I, that I've learned to, to understand and, and that my family understands now with, with the best bull's life is that it is a 24-7 job. So plans change. I might have plans to go to dinner tonight. I might have plans to go to a party tonight. But if Milkman gets sick, he's not going to get sick. But let's say he got sick or started acting weird tonight, I would cancel him. I wouldn't go. And maybe my family wouldn't go too. But a lot of times I'll tell them to go, but a lot of times they won't go because... I won't go, but I don't care. Like, you know, there, you have to prioritize. And, and if there's, I know that if, if me staying home adds a 5% chance uh, uh, better for a milkman to recover better, I'm gonna do that, you know? Now, if I knew he was fine and it didn't matter if I stayed home or not, um, I'll, I'll leave then, you know, and I'll, I'll watch him. I have the cameras, we have people that stay here and stuff. But I know that sometimes having this lifestyle, things will change and, and um, and that goes for everything too. Like a lot of people want to have layers and stuff like that and have puppies. But then when their female comes into heat, they have to go to dinner that night and their female is ovulating and they don't want to do, like, you, like you can't, you don't, this, this get, this dogs don't work around your schedule. You have to work around their schedule. So you have to get done what needs to get done. Look at, and you get messy all the time. I shower twice a day. <laughs> Probably everyone showers twice a day, but still it's annoying me. Sometimes I'll get, you know, poop on me and I'll just go shower and that's part of dog, dog life right milkman then another thing a day in the life and something that I was wanted to show you too is milkman's brother we never we never named him because he got you know reserved but milkman got delivered he went to North Carolina we delivered him and here he is with 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 his new owner she was so happy and that's just another one of the complications slash things that we have to, to adjust for in everyday life is, you know, delivering the puppies and at the same time taking care of the dogs and same time doing all this stuff. I'm gonna go into dog DNA. And this is a basic dog DNA, just for a lot of people. A lot of people don't understand. There's a lot of um, uh, um, miscommunications between people and confusions on stuff. And I'm gonna clarify it because dog DNA is science. There's no well, maybes or ifs. There's statistics and percentages, and there's hard there's hard facts. So this is basic dog DNA, and uh, just to clarify a lot for everyone, and and basic alleles and and locuses and chromosomes. I'll explain that a little bit, but most, more important, just understand just the basic like this. All right. So first, let's go over merle. Now the merle pattern is the blotchy pattern that you see on dogs. It's people, it's highly sought after. People people like it. Now what merle is, it's 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 a it's a, a deformality pretty much that dilutes and attacks the co attacks color. So it can attack blue, lilac, chocolate, and black. Those are only three color, four colors that it can attack. Well, that's pretty much all there is when we're talking about, I'm talking about English Bulldog DNA too, by the way, because there's different DNAs and different people use different allele marker, markers 
for different things like in the French blog world and stuff like that. But this is pure English blog and this is the, the general consensus. Now, so it, what Merle does, it eats away in color and causes that pretty pattern. And Merle is a dominant trait. So the Merle trait is this big M right there. If it's a little M, they do not carry, they do not have Merle. And that's why the people like, oh, do they carry Merle? There's no such thing as carrying Merle because Merle is not a recessive trait. It's a dominant trait. So one copy of Merle gives you Merle. And, it, and Merle only reacts to color, which is black, blue, lilac, chocolate. And that's where it makes that design. If it's on a fawn dog, a red dog, whatever you call it, it will not, um, it will not mutate that color and you will not get that pretty color pattern. You might get a very faint thing. So yes, that fawn dog is a Merle. Uh, and usually you can see it at birth too. You can see the patterns at birth and it sort of fades away because the, the fawn does not let the Merle discolor it. So you can have a Merle dog that's fawn or platinum because it doesn't affect those colors, but it's still Merle. It doesn't carry Merle. It's a, it's a Merle because it's a dominant trait. And that's one of the few dominant traits there is. The rest of the traits that people are, are after are recessive. And so a couple of mis, mis um, informations too. People say that a Merle dog doesn't have problems. And the problems they mean is blind or deaf. Not true with a single Merle carrier, which is they are big M, little M. If, I write messy too, disclaimer, so don't hate me on it. If the dog was, let's say, big M, big M right here, then the dog would be a double Merle. It's called double Merle. That's dangerous because that, and double Merles normally are mainly white. And what that does is the, the two, two Merles eats away too much color which now eats away the color in the, he in, in the ear development and the color in the eye development. So your dog could be partially deaf or blind and partially, uh, partially deaf or completely deaf and partially blind or completely blind. E and or either of those, either of those. So you don't want to do double Merle. That's why you never breed Merle to Merle. Now that's Merle. I'll go over all other ones as well too. So now, Lilac, Mr. President is a lilac. He's that, that color. A lot of people say, oh, does your dog carry lilac? And it, I understand why some people say it, but it's usually they don't really understand DNA. There's really no such thing as carrying lilac because lilac is not an allele. So what makes up a dog locust is two alleles. So little b, little b or whatever alleles are. And so there's no locust, no, I mean, there's no allele that's actually lilac. Lilac, what lilac is, it is the direct correlation of being double recessive blue and double recessive chocolate, which creates that lilac color. So there's no lilac color, um, there's no lilac color allele. Like there's not like a, like a, W, W, whatever, it's <laughs> super messy. That makes, and if you have two W's, you're a lilac. No, a lilac is from blue and chocolate. And it's very, it's hard to get because you have to be double recessive blue and double recessive chocolate. Meaning that both parents have to at least carry one copy of blue and one copy of chocolate. And the, the, the child has to get both copies of blue from each parent and both copies of chocolate. And that results in the lilac, which is very rare. That's why it's rare blue and that's like an escobar is a blue is different blue is little d little d double recessive for a dog to be blue they have to be they have to have two copies of blue what it would look like so if you'll say oh my dog's a blue carrier that means they are that means they are big d little d and what blue is it's actually like a form of, of black it's a dilute of black which is like a gray which we call blue so little d our big d little d is a blue carrier and DD is not, does not carry any blue. So meaning a dog that is big D, big D can never have a blue, a blue puppy ever. They can have dogs that carry blue because maybe they're the doggy breed who carries blue, but they can never have a blue puppy because for a dog to be blue, chocolate, lilac, any rare color mean, means that both parents have to carry that, that, recessive trait, bare minimum. Unlike Merle, Merle only one parent has to carry it and the dog can be Merle, not carry it, have it. In blue, it's, there is all these other, all these other, other um, traits like lilac, blue, chocolate, and try are all recessive traits. So it requires two copies for you to get, just like how people with blue eyes and green eyes. 
it's rare because both people, both parents have to carry it at least, if not be full carriers. So big D, little D, you're a carrier. Little D, little D, you are full on a blue dog, okay? And that means also too that 100% of this dog's uh, uh, children, pups, whatever you wanna call it, can ha are gonna be at least, at minimum, blue carriers. If the dog is this right here, big D, little D, that means at minimum, the, the, uh, the well not minimum, statistically speaking, all of this dog's pups will be at, will be 50% carriers of little D. And that's a statistic. So maybe all of them could be carriers, none of them could be carriers, but statistically speaking, they have enough puppies, half of them are gonna be carrier. Chocolate is little B, little B. Again, chocolate is a recessive trait. So for a dog to be chocolate, they have to be little B, little B. If they're a carrier, they're, if they're a carrier, they're a big B, little B. And if they're no chocolate, they are two Bs. Try, now try is the, our, our accent points is recessive trait as well. So it's A-T, A-T, okay? So a dog has to be double A-T to be try, okay? Like they could be A-Y, A-T, they're a carrier of try, or if they're A-Y, A-Y, they have no, no try. I'm not gonna get into it. So there's a lot of other traits like, um, that dictate fawn and dictate other stuff, but we're just gonna go into these colors right now just to, to clarify that. Now, the way traits get passed, mom up here and dad. So for example, let's say mom is a blue dog, okay? So that means she is little d, little d. Let's say dad is not a blue dog, but he carries blue. We either know that because his, one of his parents was a blue dog, or we know that because we did a DNA test which means dad is big D, little D. This is how you figure out the DNA. So, I don't know, I forget what this chart is called. Stupid me, I'm teaching DNA, I don't know what this chart's called. If you know what the chart's called, comment in, in below in the comments. But the way this chart works is, is you match them up. So you go here, draw a line over here, here, you got big D, little D, okay? The big D, little D. Again, big D, little D here, big D, Little D, little D, little D, and little D, little D, draw the draw line, boom, boom. So the the way it would work, and this is the this is the statistic, is that if you had a mom that was blue and a dad that was that was um, a blue carrier, that would mean half the dogs would be blue carriers and half the dogs would come out blue. So it's 50-50. So you would have 50-50. With thick sled. 50 50 that you're gonna get blue dogs and a hundred percent chance that all the dogs will be carriers. So that's your statistic right there. If you want a hundred percent chance you're gonna get all blue blue dogs, you would have a little D, and then these would all be little D, little D, and then higher set would be blue. So that's that's how you get your statistics, right? So a lot of people say, oh, there's a pot, like, they like, like, oh no, or yes, or, or they say that, like, I had a blue dog, my dog doesn't carry blue, then you get a blue puppy, or your dog does carry blue. It's just, this is pure science. There's no, there's no, I um, mean, some, like, guessing, I mean, there's guessing there's statistics, but if there's hard facts with it, you know what I mean? Now, and then they go over. So that's how that works. So you can do that chart if you're confused and you just sort of map it out. Basically, um, let me give you a better one to uh, some other more, some other examples. So that's why too, that's why it's so rare to have a lilac try or a blue try or a chocolate try or whatever, because not only do they have to be double recessive chocolate or double recessive blue or double recessive both, and they have to be double recessive at and So this, this chart I have to pass both times. So depending on your dog's color, will will we'll raise or lower those statistics based on what the dad is and what the mom is. So that's how you do the DNA. And my biggest one I want to clarify is Ladak. Ladak is just blue and chocolate. Okay. So a Ladak dog carries double sets of blue, double sets of chocolate. Now, the rarest color, if you want to go off just rarity, would be would be a would be a Ladak 
trimeral. And the DNA would look like this. Would be little d, little d, with a little b, little b. Ball recessive, recessive, at, at, and then dominant and merle. That's a lilac trimeral right there. Double copies of blue, double copies of chocolate, double copies of tri, and one dominant copy of merle. And that's a lilac trimeral. That's the rarest color. And this dog has the opportunity and the greatest chance of making more lilac, more trimerals, because based on who you match that dog with, you'll get that tip chance. Me personally, color is great. I love color, just so you know. But it's it's way down my list on priorities. You know, I'm looking for um, a health structure temperament and then I'll go with the color. So too many people in my opinion are like, why well, about a giant Merle? And I'm like, okay, cool. What's it look like? You know, does it run well? Does it breathe well? Is it a nice dog? Those are more important. And then I try to roll. And then you have a rare dog if you have all those other, other tape before that. But I'd rather have a fawn dog that's great instead of a try and roll dog. You have to buy a try and roll dog lack structure, temperament, and health. You know what I mean? So the basic rundown of, of them and each, the, the way each, each um, of these alleles. So this is an allele right here, just one of them. That's an allele. The way it works is each parent, like I showed you, has two copies, whether they're dominant or recessive. And then every single locus is dealt this way. Is that, you know, let's say you have mom, mom and dad, and then they both have like, mom is a blue, Dad's a blue carrier. Mom is actually, let's say mom's a lilac, so she's double blue, double um, chocolate, so she's a lilac, but a tri carrier, so A T A Y. Dad is a chocolate. Right. In fact. And dad is a tri. So mom is a blue and chocolate, which makes her a lilac. So mom's a lilac tri carrier. Dad is a blue carrier, a chocolate dog that is full tribe. So the way it works is you have one of these boxes in between each of this and they're gonna play that game and that's gonna give you your statistics on what you're gonna get every time. So I can tell you right now that right here, you have a 50% chance, just looking at that, of the dog being blue and a 100% chance the dog will be a carrier. You have a 100% chance, based on means you have both, if they pass any of these traits, it's gonna be double recessive, of the dog being chocolate. And you have a 50% chance of the dog being tri. Right. Okay, and then a 100% chance of the dog being a tri-carrier. So right here, based off these, this gets confusing too. But just understanding the basics of this, you get better at it. You need to do your own charts. So just doing this, I know that half the dogs are going to come out lilac. Because that means 100% chocolate, 50% blue. That means half, those half that get the blue are going to come out lilac. The other half are going to come out chocolate that carry blue. And then half of the of all those dogs are going to carry are going to be tri. And 100 we're going to be tri carriers. And this gets really it gets confusing when you think about, it, but it's really not. So uh, these puppies, if they had, if they had, let's say four puppies, I'm going off on a tangent. If they had four pups, okay, two will be lilac, two will be chocolate, and out of those four, two of them will be tries. Okay, so out of those fours, two will be trying. So basically, that's what you get right there. So that's statistically speaking, what you're gonna get out of four puppies, two loud, two chocolate. And if you run this back a bunch of times, you're really gonna see that these numbers always add up. Now, you could get all loud, you could get all chocolate, you could get no tries, you could get all tries. That's statistics, and if you have 100 puppies of this from this matchup, it's gonna be 50-50. Like every time, it's like it's it's the quarter game. That's all it is. It's, it's just it's just statistics. So that's just a basic run out of DNA. And every parent has two alleles for whatever trait we're talking about, whether it's blue, chocolate, tri, merle, whatever. And then one of those alleles 
the, the mom goes to the kid, and one of those and the dad goes to the kid. It's a 50%. There's no, there's like people say, oh, my dog throws out a lot of blues. He's a blue carrier, but he always throws out blues. No, he throws out 50% for blues. If he's a blue, if dad's a blue carrier, there's a 50 50 chance every single time the pup's gonna get either big D or big D or little D. Nature doesn't care. And then based on that, whether the mom is a blue, a blue carrier or a blue, you're gonna get a blue dog or a full blue, double blue dog, whatever. I know there's all kinds of other things, like there's a blue fawn, there's the black and white, there's a black, all that stuff. We'll get into that later, but I wanted to clarify blue, chocolate, and lilac DNA, basic dog DNA, bulldog DNA here. So this is the, and this is the exotic colors too, is where we have merle, lilac, blue, chocolate, try. Those are the real main colors. Black is the is main color too, but I'm gonna go with that later. Um, for right now, just gonna cover these. We haven't made episode two for Bulldog Genetics, going into more depth of the genetics, like all kinds of other things. If you wanna see it, make sure you leave comments down below and give me questions, so that's what I'll cover next episode for the Bulldog Genetics. My, uh, why you get a Bulldog? So I'd like to explain on why you would get a Bulldog. And this is my opinion, there's other opinions as well, but I have a lot of facts in here too. So you get a Bulldog because you want a pet, you want something that's gonna love you, you want a loyal dog, because like dogs have general characteristics that are in their breed and um, it makes them valuable for certain reasons. Bulldogs are valuable in my opinion because they are naturally in their, in their DNA and genetically speaking, statistically speaking, they are very nice loyal dog they don't run away like for example huskies huskies run away you let a husky out majority of them run away like they, they're horrible dogs in my opinion because they run away i don't want a dog like that you let a bulldog outside i let esquire outside he stays where he knows he stays right here he they never run away they don't wander i shouldn't say never because i'm just going off statistics but that's the type of dog they are they're a loyal loving dog now what they aren't where bulldogs aren't is they are not protection dogs. They are not going to seriously protect you. Now, that doesn't mean they're not going to alert you. They can alert you to someone in your yard, someone coming in your house, someone outside your house. Uh, dogs, um, one, hear very well. They smell very well, even bulldogs. And they also can smell things that we can't smell, like they can smell adrenaline. So if, let's say, let's say Milkman's older and he understands stuff, he's in the house and he smells a robber outside, he smells that adrenaline, he might start growling. So he can alert me. So any dog can do that too. They can alert you, especially bulldogs because they, they do have a protective side to them. But that being said, a bulldog is not going to run off a intruder majority of the time, you know? That's why I have these dogs. So I have a Newfoundland right here. This is a Newfoundland, this is, this is Baba. We, he's imported, he's super high quality. He's looking amazing. He's three months old. He's going to be huge, probably 150, 180 pounds. They are naturally very protective dogs. They are very good with kids and they have like a bodyguard instinct with kids. So I got him to watch over my daughter. He's his legit job, he's bought and he's going to be trained to watch over my daughter. I got Wick, Wick sit. I got Wick, Wick stay. Wick is about seven months old now. He's going to be nice and big. He is going to watch over the property. He's gonna watch over me, he's gonna watch over my daughter, he's gonna watch everything. He's gonna be look out. I have one more German Shepherd coming. Great dog, there's all, all kinds of attributes, attributes about German Shepherds. They love to listen, they love to please, and they are a, um, a very good watchdog. They're very agile, he can patrol the properties and do everything, so that's why I got Wick. There's purposes for it. Not only that, I love him, I love Baba too as well. They're both very nice dogs, different personalities than the, than the, the, um, <laughs> the, uh, the Bulldog, but that's, reasons why you know and like whenever you get a dog uh, you get a dog you should know like you know what you want out of the dog and um and then get a dog based on that you know like if you want a dog that's gonna go jogging for jogging with you well, like, not the dog, you know and just you know add you know, excitement and fun to your life and and just be something that's gonna like you then you get a bulldog you know same thing i can say with with wick too but you have to know what you're getting when you get it it's like getting a car you know then you'll be upset later you know you know you know bulldogs are going to be um, that kind of style. On top of that, you also have to know too about bulldogs, what you're getting too, or what you could be getting. You could be getting a, a very problematic dog that um, with health problems if you get from a bad, a bad line, bad breeder. Uh, so that's why I always talk about 
my three P's to picking a perfect puppy is the program and, and the, um, the uh, pedigree slash parents. Those two are the top two, and then the third is the puppy. Pedigree, the parents are healthy dogs too. So Milkman's gonna be healthy, his parents are healthy. I've, he's like 10 times the best bull's lines. I know his lines very well. So that being said, I know what I'm getting there. I know the attitude I'm getting, and I get everything. So I've, I, I'm very happy with that. But when you're getting a bulldog, you have to understand that, um, that you're also getting a dog that could be problematic if you don't do your due diligence. On top of that, you're also getting a more of a stubborn dog. So it requires you to, to, to give them attention, train them, spend time with them, and, um, and do the right things. And in my opinion, every dog's stubborn, which means like not listening if you don't spend time with it. Like Wick, I know uh, one of his brothers is a semi-aggressive dog because they just not, not checked him right. With me, he'll never be aggressive. He's, he, you know, because I spend a lot of time with him. Wick, come here. He'll, I mean, like, he'll never be out of line aggressive, you know? Um, but he's a more of a pleaser. Baba, come. But look at Milkman. He's looking so good. He looks awesome. Right, Milkman? He is, uh, I think he is three months old now. He's either, I think he's 11 weeks now. And staying very small and still having the bone and the thickness and the, and the, and the head and the rope and everything. So he's looking awesome. He's my little buddy. He followed me around like crazy, running after me and stuff like that. He's so cute. But... He's the next stud too. So he's gonna be, he's gonna be a micro, in my opinion. There's no guarantee if a dog's gonna be a micro or mini, or even standard, because either the parents are tiny, maybe because the dog gets, grows up huge, and that's just how the DNA worked, that's how the alleles lined up, everything. But statistically speaking, you know, if you, you breed two tiny dogs, you're gonna get tiny dogs, majority of them. And uh, he comes from Escobar, Escobar is a mini, but his dad's a micro, and then same thing with his mom's a mini, but they come from micro lines. So, and Escobar, a lot of people like to say this, you know, my, dog, my, my boy always throws nice thick dogs. Proof's in the pudding, Escobar always throws thick dogs. He always throws small dogs. He lots of times produces dogs that are even smaller than him, and this is the exact example of that. And Milkman structurally could end up better than Escobar. We'll see, time, time will tell. He's thickening up how I want to thicken up. He is short-legged, he has huge head, and that's what I'm looking for, you know? And like I always say with puppies, things amplify when they're younger. Like, so if they, are, if they have a short back now, they're gonna have a short back later. If they have a long swoopy back, they're gonna have a long swoopy back even more later when they get bigger, because it amplifies as they get bigger so you can see it. I know he just talks really fast, but based on what the little cues I see off him, his stance and everything, when, those are, when he gets into a bigger form, and it's gonna look amazing. So we painted the floors, we used the latex paint. Uh, it's a very high-end uh, paint that's non-permeable, meaning it's going to stop uh, stuff from going through. And, and so we don't have any, any pee or poop or anything soaking into the concrete, which is going to make it so it stays clean, which you know bacteria is not gonna grow in there and we can sanitize everything properly. So that's why we painted it. And it doesn't really look like we got a lot of work done, but we did a ton of work between prepping the floors and painting the floors between getting the steps in and the sewage the the sewage holes in for the inside drains and the steps and all that stuff it's it's a lot of work a lot of concrete thousands of thousands of concrete and then we're setting up the stalls and seeing if they're right and then taking them down because we realize that we still have to do this and then putting them up so it, it's you could say it's poor planning because like um, you know, like it's, you know, we had to put stuff up, take stuff down and all that stuff. But to be honest with you, sometimes in the, when we're building a, you know, custom facility like this, there's things that you don't expect and don't see. And I guess it's poor playing. So you have to take stuff down, fix it. Um, but it's very hard to see everything, you know, as, as a whole, I'm doing a really good job planning, but a lot of stuff has been. So that's like, and I know it looks like a little bit, but we got these in, this installed um the light switches for outside we have the bosco up there so they did that and that's gonna be powering for four switches it's gonna take care of um all the fans on one switch all the fan lights on another switch another switch is the other led lights so we have that being done we have 
the stalls that, um, the, the, st the, the dog stalls that are gonna allow them to come in and out. They were here, we've set them up, we've taken them down, we've set them up. So we've, this has been a lot of trial and error, but we had to um, build these steps and these steps are a lot more complex than you think because they're one, they're concrete. Yeah, here, <laughs> one, they're concrete. Um, they're, they, they're, they serve multiple purposes, okay? So of course, as a step to help you get up here, Okay, Wick, lay down. There we go, he's good, he's learning. So they serve multiple purposes. One is a step to get in, make it easier for them so they're not so hard in their joints jumping in and out. Two, uh, the drainage from inside comes out here, so if I wanna clean up the stalls inside. A lot of people ask me like why I didn't run like an underground drainage, and I want, drainage is a huge problem, and the more exposed and the more accessible it can, it can be with dogs, the better because it'll get clogged a lot and then, it's just, then it becomes unfunctional. So I have drainage inside and we can spray it out and it'll come through this hole right here and then go down into the, the drainage system here. But majority of the time they're gonna come out to their stalls to pee and poop anyway, so inside's not gonna be a problem. And uh, so the step has the drainage system in it that comes, that the, the, comes down through there. It also has um, stucco on it that slants it down, so that way we don't have, I feel this one, I feel this one up a little bit, Aaron. We gotta fix this up. Um, it, yeah, up. it also slants the wire down, so now wire doesn't stay up here, so we don't have a uh, cesspool. And this being stucco, it's not painted white yet with the, uh, with the pool sealant, I think it's called latex paint or whatever, because um, it takes 60 days for the, the um, stucco to cure. So, and then on top of that, the stalls come in between here, and it's add support as well too, even though this is not best case scenario. Oh, the other last thing th these um, steps do is they protect the building. Like I would say anything that can go wrong will go wrong and anything the dogs can chew, they will. They will chew this bottom edge right here. So we just cemented it all in, made it smooth so dogs have less to chew on. So steps took a little bit. Now the, um, the pens will be installed. We're gonna pressure wash this today. You'll see that happening. We're gonna touch up the paint here, and we're gonna install the, um, the pens. We are not gonna paint the step, only the sides, until 60 days pass. So the sides don't have stucco inside, so they can be, they can be painted out. So we can, we can do that quick, Aaron, too, just throw paint in there, pressure washing it in there, and then throw paint. So Aaron's gonna do that. We had, I'm just gonna go in on, because I know a lot of you ask about the construction, and I know sometimes it's a little boring, but that's why we have it, you know, segmented to construction, so you can, you can skip that if you want. This, we got the wall stuccoed. It was just a concrete wall with, with block, but now it's, it looks like a complete wall. And that was just purely aesthetic to make it look nice. We'll paint it in 60 days, and then we'll make the columns a little nicer and just do everything a lot nicer. So we have that going on. Out here, I'm trying to think if we had anything else. We did this one over here as well too. So these stalls have already been designed. I designed them. Not to toot my own horn, own horn, but it's pretty impressive because I designed these stalls, measurements, calculations, everything, before this concrete slab was even made. So I had to make it because I knew it was gonna take three months to get that from, from Portugal. So I designed it beforehand and had, had the pad, the walls built the spec. And it fits perfectly. Now over here, you go Aaron, yeah. Over here, we changed the design a little bit, and, then, and originally I wasn't gonna have pens over here, but now we are. So this is gonna be pens as well too. We also poured this whole slab. This is one, one piece. So the new stalls that I have coming in from Portugal that are, are, are being designed, they actually, the pen will come over, up, and around this, so it'll fit to this step. So we didn't have to put that, that space in between. That space in between holds the pens up a little bit better, but it's also, a place to for stuff to sit and rust and stuff together, so it's a problem. So we're gonna have to, we're gonna we have a, a plan for that. Where we're gonna seal it off once we get the pens installed, but for right now, it's a problem. So we have that same thing inside the drainage, and these stalls are the new stalls that have the floors designed for drainage already. So that's really nice, and we'll clean all this stuff up. We're going to keep this. We're gonna close this off. This the the drain. With a, with a metal flap and a magnet uh, for a couple of reasons. One, not to let heat and air out. 
uh, heat and cold air out depending on the time of year. And two, not to let any kind of friggin' animals, snakes, bugs, stuff in. Uh, so we're gonna close that up. Well, everyone will have a, a latch on there. So as far as outside goes, I just paraphrased all that stuff, but that was like weeks of work, like getting this step done, that step done, the stucco, the electricity now, the fans. I think the fans come tomorrow, so we have that tomorrow. We're gonna have, I think, I think they ran out of stock, Aaron, so I think we have six coming tomorrow. Okay. Maybe including this one, or maybe seven including this one, I'm not sure. Okay. But either way, we're gonna, we're gonna, by tomorrow we'll have six or seven fans down here installed operational, right? Yeah, okay. And then um, I'm asking I'm asking him because I'm not sure if, if, if it can be done. It can be done that way with, with seven at a time or no? I believe the guys are coming tomorrow. Um, all that's gonna be active and then the, uh, the fans will go up. Where the, where's Wick? Okay. Okay, I'll find him. Bob is falling, good. So then in here, we did a lot too. So, guys, please. We got the fans up there installed. Now, hey, please, stop. I'll talk about those fans, actually. Um, no, I'll talk about them now. Just don't want the dogs to bark. So we got the fans up there installed. The electricity then is coming. Hey, Noir, stop. And those are, are the main purpose of them is because a little design flaw, a not a flaw that I saw I knew was gonna happen. And these, these stalls are gonna be even taller because I have the accent walls coming. So just to make sure that there's air circulating in there, uh, I have the fans that will go on and they oscillate and blow air down into the stalls. So that's another, another, another thing. We built them really nice. I'll show you some behind the scenes footage of like how solid we put them in and how we did it, you know, the best bowl style, which we're trying to do everything the best possible. And as far as construction goes, I think that's all. Maybe I should show you guys a big announcement today. I'll let, I'm gonna decide that. I'll decide if, we're gonna, if I'm gonna do the big announcement. I've been waiting for a while to, sh to show what we have coming. It's mainly big for me, but it's pretty cool. It's gonna add some cool stuff in the future. I'll talk about it a little bit later. But yeah, that's mainly the, um, the build out. And I'll elaborate uh, on, on everything a little bit more. And if you have any questions, just put in the comment down below and I'll either answer the question, one, and or I'll do another video on that for you to elaborate if I can't answer it properly in a couple sentences. So right here, I'm gonna show one of the testimonials to someone that got a puppy from us years ago. I think he's about a year and a half old now, almost two years old. It's a Fury Sun, absolutely gorgeous. Show it's like, it's like double proof. It's like proof that Fury is an amazing stud producing this boy. And then it's just a testimony about them talking about us. I need to start getting more testimonials because I have so many good stories of people that are very happy with our service, which I take a lot of pride in. And they get a dog that's, you know, the great temperament that I tell it is, that's the health I tell them is. And, you know, I take a lot of pride in, in supplying the good service I do. So getting the testimonials is always rewarding because I know that people are happy and um, I like showing them and showing the stories because it gets to see, you get to see what we're doing and then what people are getting. And then, you know, it's, uh, it's the proof in the pudding for us as well too. You get to see, you know, what we're doing and, and how we're doing it and how good of a job we are doing. Hello, my name is Oscar. I am from California. And the way we found out about Jason and his program was through Instagram. My wife was uh, looking for our first dog and once she came across uh, Jason's page, I fell in love with Fury and I knew instantly it's the kind of dog that I would like, the structure, the size. So we reached out to Jason and he was very uh, patient with us. He was very uh, understanding that it was our first time. So he took a lot of time to answer all our questions. He was very professional, very welcoming, and uh, just a great experience overall for, for me personally being a first time dog owner. I would definitely recommend him and his program to anybody who's looking for a dog, especially for a mini dog. Uh, they are true to size, as he says they are. Uh, this is our dog here, this is about a year and a half uh, old. He's doing well, his health is well, his structure is great. When we go out, people still think he's a puppy. So just to put it in perspective, I know through videos it's hard to tell, but in real life, once you have one in person, they are great looking dogs. They're, they're, they're very nice. They're not angry dogs. They're very playful. And I would 1,000% get another dog from Jason if I do decide or we do decide, me and my wife to get one. So 
I would definitely recommend to anybody else who's looking for a dog. And I would just like to say during the whole process, my wife dealt with Jason directly. I never had uh, contact with him or spoke to him. So I want to thank Jason personally for being so professional, for being so trustworthy and for just helping us through this whole process. Once again, I really appreciate your support. Let me know what you thought about the episode, questions, concerns, comments, whatever, down below. Give me the like, click subscribe if you haven't subscribed, and follow all our other platforms. We have Instagram, The Best Bulls Ranch. We have TikTok, The Best Bulls. Thank you so much, and thanks again for watching.